A month and a half of voting has passed, and now it's time to get started on the Cold Steel 1 and 2 community ranking. Thank you to everyone who got involved with the voting, and especially to those who left their thoughts. Now after the Sky and Crossbell community rankings, I decided to make this one a little bit... different. Rather than just giving each character a flat rank, we're incorporating five parameters this time around and giving a score based on each character's merits. That total score will add to 100. After asking you guys for some assistance, I think we narrowed it down to some suitable areas of judgement. First we have story significance, which obviously refers to how important they are to the plot of Cold Steel 1 and 2. Next was dialogue, in other words how impactful are their words, and do they push the narrative along well. After that was character design, which refers to external appeal and how good they look. Fourth was character development, how much has the character changed from the beginning of Cold Steel 1 to the end of Cold Steel 2. And finally, likeability, which I think speaks for itself. I also adjusted the scaling on each parameter, as in my opinion some areas are more important to a good character than others. So for example I placed less importance on outward design and more on the character's development. It's also worth mentioning that we are only judging the characters based on their role in Cold Steel 1 and 2, not their significance to the entire series. And finally, I realised that I did miss one important character in Duke Alborea, but let's be honest, we're not missing much from his absence. He would likely be near the bottom anyway. So without further ado, let's get rolling. Starting off our list, it's one of the main members of the Imperial Liberation Front, Gideon, known as G for most of the game. But I'll tell you right now, this guy is not a G. So what is there to say about Gideon? Not much to be honest. I guess he has the honour of being one of the first big bads we see in the Cold Steel arc, but that's as far as his notoriety goes. For a guy who is supposedly intelligent, he gets outsmarted more than I can count as well. I think that this quote sums him up perfectly. Oh Gideon, a character so forgettable that he's killed off-screen in a completely different game than these. Where he didn't even have a unique character sprite, or a face, and he wasn't even defeated by any of the heroes. So yeah, Gideon sucks. I couldn't agree more. If we're keeping our character appraisal firmly fixed on Cold Steel 1 and 2, then Gideon is a chump. You see him doing bad things once in a while and then suddenly he's gone forever. And as a result, the area where he should be strongest, that being his story significance, takes a pretty big hit. Let's be honest, the rest of the parameters he just straight up fails in. Yeah, bottom spot works for this guy. Moving on to the main antagonist of Cold Steel 2, we have Duke Cayenne. Meh. Very important to the storyline, very flat character. Even Duke Duncan from the Sky series had more characterization than he did. Oh well, can't nail them all. Now apart from not knowing who Duke Duncan is, I think this concise explanation is bang on. Cayenne is the ruler of the Lemaire province and also the leader of the nobility faction during the Civil War. His ultimate goal, as he so eloquently puts it, is to bring back the good old days where the nobility existed at the precipice of Erebonian society at the expense of the common people. He would do this by reawakening the Vermilion Apocalypse which he sees as an heirloom of his bloodline. And needless to say, Cayenne is not a nice bloke. He may seem polite on the surface, but his true intentions are never too far behind the mask. He attempted to subtly threaten Victor Arsade in Cold Steel 1 to join the war effort, and in Cold Steel 2 he was willing to blackmail Reen to join the Noble Alliance by imperiling the safety of his sister and the princess. So it's satisfying to see him get his just desserts come the end of Cold Steel 2, where his supposed allies betray him during the final events of the Infernal Castle. This guy is someone who just cannot let go of the past, and ultimately, it becomes his undoing. Moving on to number 43, we have the chairman of the Reinford Group, one of the members of Ford's board of directors, and the Gahama Mama of Class 7, Irina Reinford. Now Irina is a bit of an enigma, she's the typical workaholic who won't let morality get in the way of the Reinford Group and its growth. 
She seems to take everything in her stride and is notably hard to please, which she makes apparent to her daughter on several occasions. She even betrayed her own father to usurp his position as chairman of the Rhineford Group when the Imperial Government wished to commission the construction of railway cannons at Gorelia Fortress. It's fair to say that Irina is the model of efficiency, she doesn't really show emotion through the first two games and not much phases her either. Her kidnapping in Ruhr in Cold Steel 2 is a good example of how she responds to such a situation. But there is definitely an air of a mother below the red tape, we do see that she holds on to particular mementos of her family throughout the games. And we also do know that she was invested in her family life until the death of her husband. Yeah, she may not be the picture-perfect representation of what a mother should be, but there's no doubt her stance acts as a driving force for one of the key members of Class 7. And even though she is harsh, it could be a lot worse. At number 42, we have the Governor of Heindal and another member of Thor's Board of Directors, Carl Regnitz. Now unlike Irina, Carl is an amicable bloke, he's very down to earth as evidenced by his home in the Oss district and despite his status, he will still come home at certain intervals to unwind, showing that he never lost sight of where he originally came from. I feel this quote sums him up very well. A man that carries himself with more respect than most nobles. Also, despite being surrounded by terrible people, he refuses to allow himself to be corrupted, as far as we know. He does what is right for his people. Carl has an interesting position in that he seems to get on well with everyone, even the noble faction. A man, as his son puts it, is driven by honesty and integrity. But it wasn't always like that. Carl originally was a government official at City Hall, where one of his subordinates would be introduced to his treasured niece. Despite their class differences, the relationship blossomed to the chagrin of the young heir's family, who chose to continually harass Carl's niece till she eventually took her own life. This spurred a deep hatred for the nobility within him, spurring him on, which eventually saw the removal of nobles from City Hall, and the promotion of Carl to Imperial Governor. But with his rising in rank, it also appeared that his hatred slowly dissipated as well, possibly in part to meeting a fair share of good nobles during his time in office. There's no doubt that Carl is a likeable guy for this reason, his modest nature is plain for everyone in Class 7 to see, and he carries himself with dignity. But he doesn't get enough moments to truly demonstrate his worth. That being said, the respect he exudes to those around him is also returned to him as well. Except for the time he got shot in Cold Steel 1. That was unfortunate. Oh man, uh, what's there to say about George? He's a character that suffers from something I like to call the Cold Steel Cold, in that he's important to one half of the series and pretty much a throwaway in the other half. Unfortunately for George, his moment on the assembly line comes in Cold Steel 1 and 2, which is kind of a shame considering his role in the prototype for Class 7. It wouldn't be too inaccurate to say that George is a glorified upgrade merchant. He's a guy who's there to sort out your Orbments and Arcus units and to soup up the Orbal bike so you can act out your latent Top Gun renditions. And I guess he's also a balancing tonic for one of the most annoying characters in the series. Sorry George, see you in the Cold Steel 3 and 4 ranking. Coming in at number 40, we have another member of the ILF, Vulcan. Now Vulcan's story is defined by one word, vengeance. He was once the leader of a medium-sized Jaeger Corps known as Arngarn, who took on small to medium-sized jobs that normally revolved around more menial tasks like escorts and monster exterminations. However, eventually he was approached by a certain noble who requested his services to intimidate the then recently appointed Chancellor, who the nobles were beginning to see as a threat. This eventually became Vulcan's undoing. Severely underestimating the poison ruthlessness of the Chancellor, Vulcan's squad was completely wiped out and he barely escaped of his life. Eventually joining the ILF, he lived only for revenge, which he believed he had achieved come the assassination in Heimdall. From that point on, he became a husk, a walking corpse who had every intent of going out with a bang. Which he does. In my opinion, Vulcan is bland, like overcooked chicken. He's tough, he's full of protein, but he's not all that enticing. I would feel sorry for his situation, but at the end of the day, he was a Jaeger, an occupation which comes with the potential of getting killed. 
Maybe he felt guilty for what happened to his squad, but it's an occupational hazard. You gotta live with it, my man. The fact that his character pretty much stops comes Cold Steel 1's ending means he takes quite a big hit on his overall score. Though I will admit he at least has a cool design. Wielding a minigun one-handed? That's badass. Moving on to number 39, we have the Trap Master and commander of the Zephyr Jaeger Corps, Zeno. We first see him in Cold Steel 1, guarding Duke Cayenne in Legram, and then he eventually re-emerges during the attack on Heimdall, establishing himself as an enemy for the second game. Now again, Zeno is a character who suffers from that ailment that George does, he doesn't really get much in the first half of Cold Steel. I like his design and his distinct dialect, but external appeal can only go so far. That being said, I do think his personality shines through on occasion, especially with the minor banter. It gives him this air of being an easygoing individual, well easygoing unless it concerns one of two things. He will only get serious if a job needs to be done, or if anyone tries to make a move on the girl he sees as a daughter. Which yields some nice scenes, especially aboard the Pantagruel. Ultimately though, Zeno is given a more important role in the second half of the arc, as does the next individual on our list. Real talk, Leo is a jacked up serious Zeno. They are always together, heck, they're even together on this ranking list, and they pretty much share the same traits. So really, not much to say on him that hasn't been said for his Zephyr compatriot. Moving on. On to number 37, it's potentially the smartest guy in the whole arc, and he knows it. It's Professor G. Schmidt. Now if there was ever a persona for one track mind, I'm pretty certain Schmidt would be it. The guy has one setting, to work on projects that interest him, and Adios be damned whether it's for good or evil. He's so intense when it comes to his work that even his disciples refuse to work with him willingly. Of course, it's because of Schmidt that the Noble Alliance were able to mass-produce Panzer Soldats, as he used the Azure Knight as the basis for their models. But it's not all terrible, as he also assists Class 7 by providing a badass Tachi for Valimar, not out of the goodness of his heart, mind you. There is no doubt that Schmidt is a prodigy in his own right, being one of the three disciples of Epstein, and he is definitely aware of this status. You make him upset? He won't help you. Simple as. This is a case of demand versus supply right here. Brains like Schmidt are in short stock and everyone wants them, so you better keep him on your good side. And to be honest, if I was equally as talented as him, I'd probably be quite arrogant as well. Moving on to the only teacher that can make a cape look badass while giving lectures, it's Instructor Nightheart. Straight up, I feel bad for this guy. He is enough to him that I feel he would have ended up a little bit higher on the list, but obviously you guys fought differently. At least he scored high in likability. I wish there was more to him. Military science teacher, lieutenant, panzer sold art pilot, knight in shining armour to piano teachers. He's a cool looking design too, no doubt. He has some good interactions with Reen and the rest of Class 7, particularly the Manway method. Plus he has a cute relationship with Fiona Craig. Couldn't agree more. Nightheart has a lot going for him, not to mention he literally rushed over to the Twins Dragons Bridge because Fiona was in danger. What a nice guy. But my personal favourite part regarding Nightheart will always be his patented Manway method. Completely unaccepting that Erebonian men could ever lose to women, he lets that competitive nature go in full swing for these side quests, and I like it. Heck, this guy is a peak specimen, it's only natural he expects more from his students. Definitely a good character, and if there was more to him, I'm certain he would be on par with a certain red-headed bodyguard. A terrible, terrible trope you of could a cut character from the who is one of the big sound points of Cold Steel Par two. Pass. Oh boy. It's fair to say that the youngest daughter of Schwarzer divided opinion. Now on the surface, Elise is pretty... meh. Of course, we all know her perceived obsession with her brother. But it's not blood related, man. Incest equals incest. No. Stop. But I think because we focus on that aspect too much, which admittedly she does bring on herself, it's easy for us to ignore that Elise is an important part of her brother's growth, especially in Cold Steel 2. 
I feel that mix of good versus Alabama dialogue means she takes a hit on the parameter she should have scored pretty highly on. Let's be honest here, Reem is a bit dense at times and is willing to forsake his own happiness because he thinks others are suffering due to his presence. Elise acts as one of the key individuals who puts our pro tag back on track on a few occasions, and disregarding wanting a bath with Big Bro, she does have some solid moments. It's a shame as well, but I feel Elise's best contribution in the first half of Cold Steel is during a scene where she isn't even there. But there's no doubt that her compassion for her brother, especially in this particular scene, acts as a main reason whereby Reen is able to progress beyond being a soppy sop sop. If she toned it down a bit, like say in the second half of the arc, then I think she'd be alright overall. But alas, we're judging her purely on Cold Steel 1 and 2, where she flops a little bit. Yay! The best character is here! Nah, sorry guys, I can't do it. I can't do it, I can't... For you guys who don't know, Angelica is my least favourite character in Trails, and this sums up my thoughts on her. Oh yes, the perverted lesbian. Don't get me wrong, I like the character, his character, but the getting too close to the ladies can get annoying for me sometimes. Aside from that, she is a proud and loyal friend that can do what is necessary for helping her friends and for her goals. Good character overall. J just to say, my man, this isn't a bloke, this is actually a woman. But other than that, I think the quote is bang on. The daughter of Rogner could have been a good character. She has all of the traits to be a solid member of the cast, all they had to do was remove the... Angelica. Now don't take that the wrong way, I'm fine with wider representation in games, but this is not the way to do it. It's so in your face and always at the wrong time. Not to mention it overshadows the positive aspects that Angelica no doubt possesses. She's loyal to her friends, she literally sacrificed her position at Fours to help them in Rua, she was instrumental in removing her father from the Civil War by beating him down, and she's also a banging fighter. There's a lot to like about Angelica. If they just toned down the other side, I would actually be a lot more favourable to her. But alas, she will likely remain as my worst character in the series. It's over, my man. You deserve better. It's a shame, really, because I can understand why he ends up so far down the list. Take away the artician from his title and you have the word that many people attribute to him. And honestly, when I first played Cold Steel 1 and 2, I really did not care for him all that much. He was a nice guy, supposedly quite strong because of his unique use of art, but that's about it. He's kind of just there to prop up the more important characters. The main issue is that Toval gets absolutely screwed in terms of character development because his character is sold to us via a manga and an in-game novel. And let's be honest, a lot of new players will likely not know of these. That is a shame because after reading the added literature, he became one of the most interesting characters in the series for me. But of course, we're not including extras outside of Cold Steel 1 and 2 here, so let's just call it how it is. Toval is a side character. He was always meant to be a side character, someone who embodies the Bracer ideology by supporting the main players. He gets a little moment to shine at the start of Cold Steel 2, and there's no doubt a lot of people in the games rely on his experience, but I'm not surprised that he failed to hit home for many players. Don't worry, Toby, you'll always have your church, babe. And that is it, guys. Part 1 of the community ranking is complete. Thank you very much for watching. Hopefully I'll be able to get Part 2 out very soon if I'm not too busy. Have a good one. Peace.